This is Fortune's Wheel, a podcast history of the late Middle Ages. I'm your host, Jonathan, and this is episode 10, because Ethelred. episode, well, things got real. Canute, the current Danish scourge to wreak havoc upon England, is temporarily defeated and set sail for Denmark. But before he left, if you remember, he maimed boatloads of English hostages and dumped them in Sandwich. We pick up the story there, when Ethelred, recently returned to the English throne wearing his proverbial cone of shame, decides to re-establish his authority in arguably his dumbest move yet. Why? Because, well, Ethelred, that's why. I hope you enjoy the show. While Canute's away, Ethelred decides to play. Play with fire, that is. He has the brilliant idea to make his authority known once again across England. And I feel like, you know, it might not have been his idea. Not entirely, anyway. We were also introduced to a man named Edric Strayona in the last episode. Do you remember him? That snake? That, that Grima worm tongue whispering his polluted ideas into his liege's ear? There's nothing to prove my suspicions of this that I found anyway, but, but this is exactly the type of thing that Edric Strayon is known for, so I can't help but kind of go with that. But before we get into that, I also want to do another quick reminder. It's all going to go into play here in, in today's episode. A quick reminder, do you remember Ethelred's nickname? I mean, he had a few names on record, like, like Ethelred II and Ethelred's son of Edgar the Peaceful, and I'm sure his people considered him a son of, well, I'm sure there were a few things his countrymen and women thought he was a son of besides their beloved King Edgar, but they're, they're not exactly recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, unfortunately. But fortunately for us too here, because, you know, I'm pretty sure they'd be a little inappropriate for our younger listeners, but he did go by another nickname, one that has haunted him since about a century or so after his death. Ethelred Unred, or Ethelred the Unready. And to clarify, that nickname is really a clerical error in translation. Whereas Ethelred essentially meant good counsel, Unred didn't exactly mean unready, it actually meant ill-advised. So let's get this straight. Ethelred's great-grandfather, they called Alfred the Great. Ethelred's grandfather... Edward the Elder, was described by William of Malmesbury as, quote, incomparably more glorious, that is to say, than his father Alfred, in the power of his rule, end quote. Ethelred's father, the man who kicked out another vicious Viking usurper named Eric Bloodaxe from England, they called him Edgar the Peaceful. Ethelred's murdered brother, albeit a quintessential Joffrey, They still named him Edward the Martyr. But Ethelred's nickname for posterity boiled down essentially to Ethelred, some guy born into a legendary royal family who couldn't even sign his name without messing up. Yeah. Ouch. You know, I feel like Monty Python missed a golden opportunity to lampoon yet another bit of British history here. So what is Ethelred Unred's brilliant plan to to earn his place back among the English nobility? Okay, cue the Benny Hill music and let's get this story started. The first thing I feel like he did, again, was listen to Edric Wormtongue Strayona, but what we know for sure is that he sent his forces north 
to a little region just south of Northumbria called Lindsay. Today, Lindsay is now located within the county of Lincolnshire, and Gainsborough has the distinction of being the place where Swain Forkbeard, if you remember, died back in February 1014. And, unfortunately for them, not a single Premier League squad. Sorry, I had to. Why go to Lindsay, you ask? Being the place where the last king of Denmark died a few months earlier, they also had thrown their weight to Canute as, well, Canute was the guy in charge of the Vikings currently occupying their region. Ethelred, in his infinite wisdom, decided to punish that move on their part, and he sent a ruthless force of Englishmen into the northern Danelaw. They stole valuables, they murdered men and women and children alike, they, they burned houses down to ashes, whole villages were wiped out and fields were scraped clean. Lindsay suffered a terrible fate to Ethelred's uncharacteristic speed and decisiveness. Remember, though the people in Lindsay chose Canute as their king, again, he was the occupier in the area, the Witten, or governing body of eldermen in England, voted to invite Ethelred back from exile in Normandy, under conditions. Is this what the Witten had envisioned when they demanded Ethelred, quote, rule better than he did before? Hmm. After Lindsay, it's safe to say that deep fissures erupted in English society, and, and make no mistake, it started at the top. The very top. We don't know exactly who led the expedition to Lindsay, but one possible suspect is Ethelred's eldest son, Ethelstan Etheling. Ethelstan was a beloved warrior prince who was fine-tuned for the life of a nobleman. He's remembered as a man of striking good looks, a formidable presence on the battlefield, and one who was expected to rule well after his father's passing. There was a lot of hope in Ethelstan. It's important to know that we literally know next to nothing about Ethelstan besides random passages from time to time. He made his first appearance as a witness of his father's in 993, when he was maybe six or seven years old, but so much else is mere conjecture until we read of his request to his father in late spring 1014, asking for permission to write up a will. He must have known something everyone else at the time didn't, because by June, he was dead. But all hope was not lost for England. Not yet, anyway. There was another, Ethelred's second oldest son, named Edmund. Edmund, we can assume, rode with his brother Ethelstan across the English countryside, accompanying him in diplomacy as well as on campaign, because Edmund was also a terrifying presence on the battlefield. See, Edmund was a guy, much like his brother, you, that you probably wanted on your side. I mean, his bravery and prowess and virtually indestructible character earned him the nickname Edmund Ironsides. Take that, Pops. Edmund was most likely devastated at the passing of his brother. We can assume they had a pretty tight bond due to their upbringing. See, when Ethelstan and Edmund's mother, Ethelred's first wife, died around the year 1001, they were still young men, you know, just entering adolescence, and, and their grandmother most likely raised them in the court. When Ethelred then married into the Norman nobility with Emma, the boys, and oh yeah, their youngest brother Edwig, can't forget about him, were soon cast aside as Emma gave birth to a couple sons of her own, one of which would become immensely important to our story later. Another reason we can be sure of Ethelstan's and Edmund's closeness is found in an odd place, Ethelstan's last will and testament. Ethelstan, being next in line of succession, well, he had a lot of stuff, a lot of pretty valuable stuff. I mean, sure, he had a lot of land to bequeath to family and friends and even servants. He even treated the guy who sharpened his swords and polished his armor. But to Edmund, he willed something on a whole new level. See, centuries earlier, England was, shocker, a mess. But one man, one Angle king, united many of the disparate kingdoms into the island's first unified region called Mercia. He was a legend on par with Arthur and even later Alfred by this time, and his name was Offa. Ethelstan, according to his will, 
left Edmund Offa's sword. Now, as far as brotherly love goes, that's probably one of the best gifts Edmund could have received. And Edmund would see to it that Offa's sword saw plenty of Viking blood in the name of England in the coming years. So instead of ridding himself of those treacherous folks in Lindsay, Ethelred has now not only lost one heck of an heir, but he also gained one heck of an enemy. An enemy from his own household. Young Edmund. But Edmund, though still loyal to the English people, always loyal to the English people, could not stand by and watch his father burn bridges with the very people that could help defend this island and one day mend it. No one will ever know the extent to which Edmund's anger at the retribution against Lindsay would have been left on the back burner had one thing not happened. Strike that. Had one person not happened. And of course that person, that snake, is Edric Striona. In north-central Mercia, just west of Lindsay, King Ethelred had two important things he relied on to, or, to keep order and provide support when needed. However, rumor had it these things, these two men, brothers actually, named Morcar and Siegfurth, had opened negotiations with Swain Forkbeard. So at a council in the early part of 2015 in Oxford, Edric Strayona invited them for a little sit-down. Now, we don't know the manner in which Edric did the deeds, but we, we do know that it was then that the snake struck again. It was soon common knowledge that Morcar and Siegfurth were assassinated, and along with it came the knowledge of Edric Strayona, who was seen with him. Couple this with Edric's relationship to the king. Remember, he had somehow weaseled his way into a marriage with Ethelred's daughter. And his not-so-clear reputation, well, it didn't take long for Ethelred to be implicated in the murders as well. This, well, this was about all that Edmund could take of his father's nonsense. To Edmund, the English people were already living under a suffocating blanket of fear that the Danes were sure to come back and try another coup. So why is Ethelred creating his own sense of distrust with his people? Isn't that in direct opposition to the very conditions in which he was invited back not even a year before? Edmund was done. This warrior prince would not wait for Edric Strayona to strike again. Edmund decided to do what his father never could. Trust his gut and gain the people's trust. When Ethelred ordered that all of Morcar's and Siegfurth's possessions and land be immediately turned over to the crown... Oh, and uh, go ahead and bring Siegfried's wife along, too. Well, en route, Edmund stepped in, and before the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle can unfurl another piece of parchment, Edmund had married Siegfried's widow, Edgith, thus wresting control of not only his lands, but his hold on northwest Mercia. And before Ethelred could even fathom what had just happened, Edmund quickly earned the support and loyalty of the five boroughs, which were the influential towns of Stamford, Leicester, Derby, Notting Nottingham, and Lincoln. By 1015, there was a major civil war erupting, which gets next to no airtime these days. But these were crucial days for the island nation. What happens over the next two years will have, in my very humble opinion, almost as big an impact on England as, dare I say, the, the Danish conquest or the Norman conquest just 51 years later. Make no mistake about what's happening here and how it got to this point. By 1015, Ethelred has been on the throne for about 37 years, except for that little exile between 1013 and 14 in Normandy. Ethelred has more or less contracted his own hitman, and everyone knew about it and had strong suspicions as to who it was. People were supremely upset with their king when they heard about Morcar's and Siegfried's assassinations, which undercut any trust they might have held out when their king returned. Ethelred's own son all but defected and even married the widow of one of Ethelred's hits. And on top of that, this same son was the leader of men and a warrior in the truest sense, having proven himself on the battlefield already. Well, he'd already cut away a portion of Ethelred's kingdom and even, get this, brokered a deal with Uhtred the Bold, Earl of Northumbria, also known as 
brother-in-law to Edmund, as Ethelred had married off his daughter Elfgifu to Uhtred years earlier, as consolation for what he did there. Yeah, remember Northumbria? Remember what Ethelred supposedly ordered back in 1007? No? Well, here's a quick refresher. It's the first time, except for a witnessing of court business, that we see Edric Striona. Do you remember how Edric invited the Elderman of Northumbria for a, for a hunt, and all of a sudden the Elderman was dead? Oh, and, and do you remember how this Elderman's two sons were suddenly blinded? Well, regardless who remembers... Oh, can I, can I say it again? The North remembers... Uhtred was only too happy to see what he can work out with the king's defiant son. So now Edmund has northern Mercia. Lindsay, who is pretty ticked off at both Canute and Ethelred at the moment. The five boroughs and Northumbria. And as he's beginning to ravage his other brother-in-law's lands to the south. Yeah, Edric Strayona's lands. Remember, he's a brother-in-law too. Ethelred is reeling. And as Ethelred frantically and furiously, I'm sure collects his wits, his resources, and his manpower, another storm approaches. Canute has returned. Okay, so imagine being Canute just for a moment. This guy's father dies, leaving him king of England. But the English vote back in their worthless king currently twiddling his thumbs in Normandy. You can leave your base of support and try to strike at the heart of your former kingdom's economic heart of London, only to fall woefully short. So what do you do? You throw a hissy fit of epic proportions and cut the ears, noses, and hands off thousands of healthy English hostages that you, that you could have ransomed big money for had they not become damaged goods. And then you take your ball and you go home. You head back to Denmark, where you find your older brother already sitting on the throne and having amassed a pretty solid retinue of support while you've been away with dad, having a wholesome father-son experience of, you know, raising towns and, and maiming innocent people and, and trying to forcibly annex an entire kingdom for yourself. You know, just good old father-son time. Little's known about his year in Denmark, but upon his return to England, we can only assume that his brother... King Harold of Denmark, had helped raise a fleet, patted him on the back, and wished him the best of luck. But just imagine pulling into port and hearing that the, that the very people you're trying to take over are bickering, like, like violently bickering. Then stop and think about the fit of laughter Canute might have shared with his most trusted leaders until he realized that the very lands they were destroying were, well, in his eyes, his lands. And the very people they were killing were, in his eyes, his subjects. Make no mistake, this was civil war. The English, more or less, were split into a north-south orientation. Danelaw versus Wessex all over again, just like the days of Alfred. Only this time, the Danelaw of the north wasn't led by a Dane, and Wessex wasn't led by an Alfred. And as Edmund's forces moved south toward London, Ethelred fell ill in Cossum. So, of course, Edric Strayona assembled an army of Mercians and Saxons, largely from the towns of the Thames. But while Edric made his moves toward amassing his own fighting force for reasons that will soon become apparent, Canute, probably shaking his head amusedly, began plundering Dorset and others nearby with his force of at least 200 ships. That's a big force. Edric struck a deal with Edmund, for reasons contemporaries could only assume was in the best interest of England, and, well, against Edmund's better instincts, he allowed Edric's forces to join his own. Surprisingly, nothing happened, and as Edmund cautiously breathed a sigh of relief, Edric quietly stripped Edmund of forty boats of men, and then quickly met with Canute. Yeah, you heard that right. Edric Strayona struck again. Edric Strayona was now in league with Canute's Danish forces to overthrow both Ethelred and Edmund. It was at this point, just after the new year of 1016, that Edmund decided to strike again at Canute's English stronghold, Edric Strayona's Mercia. He mustered a fairly large contingent to raid the towns throughout Mercia, along with Uhtred the Bold of Northumbria. But Canute had an inside man 
Don't forget, Edric Strayon had just defected to the Danes and most likely outlined the details of English political life, including Uhtred's claim to Northumbria. Canute hastily headed for Northumbria and took it by storm, causing Uhtred to fall back. When he returned, he was forced to submit to Canute's forces. This, however, did little for him personally as Canute had him assassinated and replaced with a trusted warrior. Eric Hackinson Edmund must have been severely disheartened at this development, and he was left reevaluating his situation. While Edmund reevaluated, Canute pushed southward toward London itself. Edmund had no choice but to engage Canute's forces, cutting the Danes off before they made it to London. Edmund's forces, mostly comprising of men from northern Mercia at this point, still held strong allegiances to the House of Wessex and its king, Ethelred. They decidedly declared they would not fight without their king's presence or consent, as though they supported Edmund, Edmund still wasn't their king. So begrudgingly, Edmund sent word to his father of his plans and urged him to meet him with his forces, so maybe their joint effort could once and for all rid the island of its next Viking usurper. Ethelred, feeling no better than he did a few months earlier, having read his son's request, gathered his army and headed northward. But, in true Ethelred fashion, he second-guessed Edmund's intentions, doubted the reasoning, and promptly turned around and headed back to the security of London. Edmund, once again disappointed by his king's decisions, once again let down by his father, was forced to parallel Canute's forces down to London, hoping he could still cut them off and divert the Danes away. Maybe, just maybe, Ethelred would see reason and come to his son's aid. He was, after all, his father's heir to the throne at this point. And he had earned the nickname Ironsides by this point as well, as well as the admiration of so many of the king's subjects. He was an honorable man to fight alongside, Edmund was. And he was alone. I mean, maybe, just maybe. On April 21st, 1016, Edmund and Canute drew closer to one another. On April 22nd, 1016, they neared the city on the Thames. And on April 23rd, 1016, Ethelred II, King of England, a man who would one day be known for his indecisiveness and peculiar knack for picking the worst possible advisors to surround himself with, died. Edmund Son, brother, he was truly alone at this point. The Civil War wasn't quite over, unfortunately, because now England had a new dilemma. See, when a king dies in medieval England, custom held that the next male heir to the throne rose to assume the crown. However, in April of 1016, England found itself in a pretty sticky situation. I mean... Technically, didn't they now have two people with claims to the throne? On the one hand, Edmund was the eldest living son of the kings. Therefore, it should be a, a pretty open-shut case, right? The king dies, his kid becomes the new king. But not everybody agreed with Ethelred's return. Some people submitted to Swain Forkbeard two years earlier, didn't they? When Swain Forkbeard died, he technically died as... King of England, though never crowned, having forced Ethelred into exile by doing so. So, the king dies, his kid becomes the new king, right? And seems how Canute's claim precedes Edmund's claim by two years, wouldn't Canute be the rightful heir to the throne still? This was not an easy thing to figure out for the people of 1016. This decision would define an unfathomable number of possible outcomes for England. So, the English elderman convened another Witten in Southampton. During this time, the people of London declared Edmund King Edmund II of England, assuming that their own national hero, their warrior prince, who has proven himself time and again over the previous few years as a cunning strategist, a born leader, and an ardent supporter of English prosperity, would receive overwhelming support from their countrymen. However, 
However, yeah, well, Southampton was currently under Dane law, and the outcome didn't exactly mirror London's sentiments. The Witten chose, surprisingly, Canute as the new king of England. And so the civil war continued. It was now between King Edmund II, son of Ethelred II, the former king of England, versus King Canute, son of Swain Forkbeard, also former king of England. And it was for all the marbles at this point. Whoever won this contest would define the islands next century and beyond. Canute immediately gets to work on London. Edmund was there, so it made perfect sense to try to cut the proverbial, or literal, head off the competition. But Edmund snuck out, crossed the Thames with his retinue, and the London- Londoners were left to defend for themselves and pray for the safe return of their king, and maybe a force to support his claim. And believe me, London held their own just fine to the point of admiration from Canute himself. Meanwhile, Edmund soon gathered a stout force of Saxons throughout his ancestral lands of Wessex. In fact, they flocked to his support, and when Canute caught wind, he backed off of London in order to size up the new force. But Edmund pushed, and sometime during the late spring, we hear of a massive victory for Edmund Ironsides against Canute at Brentford. This truly earned Edmund the respect of his countrymen, and there were rumblings of eldermen who supported Canute at the Witten a month earlier, who might be questioning their current allegiances. Public opinion quickly began swinging back toward Edmund. It must have been exciting to see the events of Alfred over a century earlier replaying themselves. The lands of England succumbing to a horde of vicious marauders, its people suffering at the bloody hands of Danish kings, their king beaten almost completely, yet he rises to rid the island once again. Wait, what's that? It's not like that? I mean, it's kind of like that, right? No? Why? Wait, why? Oh, right. (sighs) Because Ethelred. I mean, even dead, that guy still manages to do his best to do his worst. During the summer of 1016, Canute and Edmund met for a two-day battle. And man, it, it wasn't pretty, to put it lightly. The second day, the battle had moved a ways to Wiltshire, and Ethelred somehow strikes again via an old accomplice. In the heat of the battle, Edmund fighting alongside his countrymen and Edric fighting against his countrymen. The fury of the moment wrapped up even the most disciplined of them. Bodies piled up and then trampled on as shield walls broke on both sides. The deafening clangs and and the pounds of swords against shields and helmets, and for those lucky enough or wealthy enough to have them, armor plates and chainmail neck guards nearly drowned out the cries of anguish and the gurgles of mouths filled with their own blood. War is ugly. Battles are brutal. But piercing a man's heart with an iron sword, with no time to think about what he'd just done before removing the sword, and plunging it into another man's body, well, well, that's hell. As the fight raged, Edric lobbed off the head of a Saxon warrior and raised it high in the air, declaring that he'd killed the great Edmund Ironsides. His bloody hand held the greasy hair of the man's head for all to see. He swung it in all directions, and almost instantly, the soldiers under Edmund began to flee the battlefield. Their leader... Dead. Dead at the hands of an English elderman. Their hopes for a unified England under a Saxon king dashed. Everything they'd sacrificed, dripping from that head onto an already blood-soaked ground. A man in the distance opposite the spectacle removed his sword from a Viking warrior, kicking the corpse aside, raised his head and noticed the tide of Saxons running his way. Confused, he looked in all directions, not seeing the cause of the retreat, until, off in the distance, far ahead of him, he saw a man raising the head of, who was that? The king. The king of England. The island's last remaining hope against Danish rule. Hang on a minute, though. 
This warrior refused to believe it. He called his retreating men to turn. Turn and fight. That wasn't the king. That wasn't Edmund II. That wasn't the man they called Ironsides. This man removed his helmet and shouted to the men around him that the king lived. The king was still fighting on the battlefield. He knew the king lived because because he was the king. King Edmund rallied his men and they stormed the battlefield once again. But alas, the edge had been stolen from Edmund's men and they eventually lost the fight and were forced to retreat. It was a devastating loss, not only for Edmund's men, but also for national morale. The pendulum swung back toward the middle until October of that year, all because of Edric Strayona's characteristic deceit, all because this snake was allowed to slither around allegiances for so long, all because Ethelred. Edmund's rise and fall is certainly a fascinating one, especially insofar that it's of a man left holding someone else's catastrophic mess. And the consequences of that mess certain, meant certain death of not only himself, but of his family's proud history atop the throne of England. And for so much to happen within such a tiny window of time, during such turbulent times, for this man to gain the notoriety and reach legendary status in a nation with so many legends already by the year 1016, well, that was truly remarkable. Edmund would suffer a crippling defeat on October 8th, 1016, near Assenden. No one really knows for sure where Assenden is, but many historians believe it to be near the town of Rochford in southeast Essex, a mere 20 miles or so from where this all started 25 years earlier, with Olaf Tryggvason's defeat of the Elderman Britnoth on the marshy fields outside Malden. Canute and Edmund met to discuss terms of peace after Assenden, and they determined that, under the circumstances, Edmund would hold his ancestral lands of Wessex, while Knut would become king of all the lands north of the River Thames, including London, the town that repeatedly repelled Knut's forces during the previous years. It's said that at Assenden, Edmund not only suffered a devastating blow to his bid for control of England, even though it's called a draw in the history books, but he also suffered a devastating injury. This is not exactly confirmed, though, but we know that by November 30th, 1016, Edmund Ironsides was dead. His wife, Edgith, had bore him two sons, Edward and Edmund, respectively. Canute effectively held control of all of England, usurping Edmund's hold on Wessex upon his death. He quickly began moving the aristocracy around and installing his most trusted Danish warriors, including... Thorkel the Tall. Yeah, that Thorkel. You know, the tall one. And as for Edmund's sons, well, they, they will have an interesting story that we'll get to in time. But Canute's, uh, he's just getting started here, believe it or not, in England. A king in name only heading into the Christmas season of 1016, Canute would begin consolidating and organizing his new kingdom as well as dreaming. And make no mistake, this young king dreamed big. I hope you enjoyed today's episode on the fall of one dynasty and the rise of another. Thank you all for downloading and listening. Our numbers keep increasing, which is a testament to all of you. So please keep sharing this podcast with those you know and your social media accounts. Don't forget to tag us too if you share us on Twitter, at Wheel Podcast. Or drop a quick line about the latest episode on Facebook, Fortune's Wheel Podcast. I update these pages weekly and would love to hear from you. Also, you can email the show at fortuneswheelpodcast at gmail.com, which I check almost daily. There is a lot left to be said of England's 11th century, so stay tuned. In fact, the entire 11th century is, well, I mean, it's a madhouse. There are so many directions to take this story in, but I'm not quite ready to leave England yet. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, I can't wait to share the stories of other people and in other places throughout Europe while Ethelred was busy, you know, destroying the dignity of his royal house. But we need to see this story arc out. We don't have much farther to go, but we need to know how we jump from Knut's reign all the way to the massive power grab of three of medieval Europe's most impressive leaders, Harold Godwinson, Harold Hardrada, and of course, William the Conqueror. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here. To recap, we followed the end of days for the Anglo-Saxons, beginning more or less for our purposes here in 991 with the invasion of Olaf Tryggvason, all the way to Canute's claim over the entire island. But saying you're king is one thing, you still need to prove it. Make no mistake, young Canute is not quite the great yet, but we will take a look at the clever, yet considerably risky maneuvers he makes to establish a firm grip on his new kingdom. And we'll also see how he extends far beyond England too. In the next episode, we'll take a look at the first gasps of Canute's powerful but short-lived North Sea Empire. I can't wait to tell you about it.